Reed and Barton factory site is located on West Britannia Street in Taunton, Massachusetts, also known as the Silver City, just two miles to the northwest of the Old Colony History Museum. We got a chance to explore the grounds and go behind the scenes at the factory site and are excited to share this opportunity with you on this virtual visit. Please keep in mind this is private property and the OCHM staff was granted special permission from the current owners for our visit. The 16-acre site is situated between West Britannia and Danforth Streets. It contains eight primary brick buildings constructed in the 19th century, aligned in east and west rows on both sides of the Mill River. The site also once supported a foundry, tin shop, machine rooms, and carpenter's shops. The 600-foot west row is made up of four connected factory buildings and includes the oldest surviving structure on the site at its northernmost end. This section of the complex once housed the Taunton Britannia Manufacturing Company, which moved here in 1830. On the eastern side of the Mill River, there is another 600-foot row of interconnected buildings, including a two-and-a-half-story Italianate-style building, which dates to 1865. There is a mansard-roofed building with stair tower built between 1871 and 1881, which was the later home of the executive offices and showrooms. In the early years, the factory depended on the river's water power to run the machinery. Today, the Mill River lends a natural balance to the industrial surroundings. The company that would become Reed & Barton evolved through a series of other partnerships. The company's namesakes, Henry Reed and Charles Barton, had been involved in earlier versions of the company, since 1828 and 1827 respectively, first working for the firm Crossman, West and & Leonard, and later teaming up with Leonard to form Leonard, Reed & Barton. Ultimately, Leonard would sell his stake in the company, leaving Reed and Barton to strike out on their own in 1840. For more than 150 years, Reed and Barton built a reputation as one of the country's top makers of high-quality giftware and tableware. The company received many prestigious honors and awards, including a Medal of Excellence at the 1876 Philadelphia Centennial Exhibition. Reed and Barton also produced the Olympic medals for the 1996 Atlanta Games. The company employed thousands of people whose work is preserved in the collections of the Old Colony History Museum. We hope you enjoy this look behind the scenes at the site of one of the most historic businesses in the Silver City. Dan Foley. I'm uh, one of the uh, partners in the uh, Reed and Barton Development Company, which is the uh, group that uh, acquired the assets to the plant in 2016. The original plant started in 1824 and was in continuous operation up through 2016, uh, where it became a development opportunity rather than a working factory. We're standing here in the lobby which represents some of the examples of products that were made by Reed and Barton, you know, from the early 18th century up through the 1996 Olympics. And behind you, with somewhat uh, tongue-in-cheek, is a set of the rules for working here. This is Dave Cordea. Dave is actually the day-to-day -day, uh, manager of the facility. He knows more about it than probably anyone else on the planet. He's been here, he says, 43 years. It's probably more like 143 years. <laughs> it's actually 48 years. I started here in 1974. Um, I, at the end of the term of Reed and Barton, I was the uh, maintenance director. Um, so when Peter and Dan came through and bought the property, um, they offered me the, the position, and I gladly accepted it.
There are more than 20 buildings on the site and the site covers approximately uh, 16 acres including the Mill River which runs through it and what used to be the raceway that uh, powered the, uh, the water wheel that provided the power in the 19th century. This is a typical building of the manufacturing process that was here at Reed and Barton. Uh, we're on the third floor of building 14. There used to be a bunch of different kind of operations going on here. There was uh, chasing for flat for hollow air. There was assembly, there was grease buffing, inspection, a lot of different stuff going on. So this is on the flat way, on the hollow air side of the of the uh, facility. The other side of the facility is knives, forks, and spoons, flatware. So this is a typical building. Um, four floors of this. Okay, so this is the Reed and Barton corporate showroom. Um, the functions were sales and corporate meetings, um, employee functions, um, stuff like that. Um, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place to be. We had all our sterling silverware here, which is now stainless steel. Um, but yeah, we had all our teapots, everything, all our uh, all our stuff for sale were on these shelves and. You know, major corporations would come here and order their their goods from this showroom. These little pictures here are um, designers' uh, cards, which they used to make a couple of different patterns, and then they could pick, you know, one on one on the other. Um, this one here is from August of 1978. This one here would be, yep. Oh, this is also 1978, so they must have had three or four different patterns that they could choose from, and from that, we probably picked one, and they went on to be a new silver pattern. So over here, we have uh, the three sterling patterns that we have left. Um, our number one seller was Francis I. Our number two seller was the 18th century pattern, and our number three was the Pointe Antique. Back in the day, um, during World War II, Reed and Barton kept correspondence with the soldiers that were overseas, and they used to actually putting it in a little magazine. It was called The Silver Lining, but at the time, they did strictly um, war heroes. Um, they would write letters back and forth, and the letters that they wrote back would end up in the Silver Lining. During the war, um, Reed and Barton switched over a lot of its tooling um, and made a lot of surgical instruments. Um, one of the things they made was a, um, it was a sterling, almost like a kite, that if one of the Air Force guys' planes went down, they could float this kite up and they could be found it was made with sterling so that the, I guess it was conductive to whatever kind of radar that they were using and they could find them.
executive dining for the entire facility. There's three seat buildings all around us, behind us, and down this way. So the central location where management would gather, you know, to have their meals or whatever else like that. There's even, it's not working, but there's even a, uh, 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 early 20s telephone. And this is a, a, a picture from 1865 of all the employees celebrating some event. And in the foreground, you can see, is a eucalyptus tree that is still there on the property. In the bowels of one of the older buildings, and this was actually a functioning accounting area slash safe where uh, back in the day you know people were paid in cash at the end of every week so the money was kept in here as were the payroll records now many of the records are gone but there's still some some uh, trays here that have payroll records going back to the early part of the uh, 20th century. Also, invoices to, from customers. I hope they've all been paid. Uh, it's really kind of a snapshot of uh, a moment in time that's long gone. Down below us is the old raceway, which used to be the water feed for the wheel that generated the power in the 18th century. Uh, in, in partnership with the state, you know, we, we turned it into a park uh, that uh, really cleans up the area and gives this, you know, a much better aesthetic than it had when it was a functioning uh, uh, track of water. Uh, out the window to my right is the old smokestack, which is, we've now repurposed into a cell phone tower. Uh, and it, uh, it provides service for a, a pretty broad range of uh, cell phone customers. from the first floor, which is a company called Wormwood Gaming. Uh, they are one of our first tenants, and they started out in a relatively small amount of space, about 14,000 square feet. They're now up to about 100,000 square feet. And they are one of the leaders in worldwide gaming furniture. Not casino tables, but rather uh, gamer tables for Dungeons and Dragons and various and sundry other board games. This is pure development space. It could be used for retail, it could be used for commercial, it could be used for industrial. It, it's got great windows. This side overlooks the Mill River. This side overlooks some of the other buildings on the grounds. And it's, it, it's perfect for art space if we need to. Lots of light, lots of uh, windows. And uh, we're ready to move forward with development.